relax right here. So you can't lick me while we're doing a video. This is not that kind of video, right? Think you can sit here like this for the whole time? <laughs> More somber. We don't want her to be a distraction. Okay. Oh, is recording still? Oh. Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. I'm continuing the story with my friend Rick Turner. You know, before he passed away, we had a lot of conversation about his case and his experience from his, from his view of what was going on in the penitentiary. So, <clears throat> you know, how Rick Turner got national attention as far as like news reporters and people that wanted to interview him while we were there in Florence was because of his selling. Rick was arrested in Virginia and he was housed in the federal facility over there on the East Coast. And the guy that he put in the cell with was Paul Manafort. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the name Paul Manafort. Manafort. He was Donald Trump he was related to Donald Trump somehow, either on his campaign or something. But anyway, they were trying to get Paul Manafort to testify or make a statement on Donald Trump for the Russian collusion or for whatever other corruptions that they were trying to get Trump on. Which we all know now at this time that the Russian collusion was a hoax. Regardless what political leaning you're involved in, what your ideology is, you have to accept the facts for what they are and see them for what they are. Facts, the dossier that was created to trigger the Trump-Russian collusion investigation was fabricated by the Hillary Clinton team. That's just fact. The Durman investigation report just came out a few months back stating everything that I'm about to share with you. So <clears throat> the FISA warrants that was put in place to get a warrant on Donald Trump were under false pretense. The director of the FBI signed it, the judge granted, and so on for the next four or something years was Russian collusion. So they had Paul Manafort in solitary confinement. He wasn't in the regular population because they were trying to put the pressure on him to make a statement against Donald Trump. Well, somehow Rick ends up being placed in his cell. So every time Paul Manafort went to court, you already know there's news cameras and reporters, it's a big old freaking circus. And they're over there taking pictures of Paul Manafort. Well, while they were there, a reporter noticed that there was another guy that was always with Paul Manafort. And uh, so she inquired and found out that this other guy's name is Rick Turner. And that's how she came about with her story. There's articles and stuff that's been written by this lady. I don't know her name. But while we was in Florence, she was communicating with Rick through the email, trying to get his his story and, and, what, what, and whatnot. But... <clears throat> Through the course of my conversation with Rick Turner, it helps support my claims that we're not being sent into prison for our crimes, which being sentenced to prison for your crime is, is reasonable. And that's the way it's supposed to work. You break a law, you commit a crime, you get a sentence, you go pay your dues to society or however. 
But a lot of people that I met, that I've been saying, are not in there because they killed somebody. Not in there because they sold drugs or because they robbed a bank. They're in there because when they got arrested, they refused to cooperate with somebody, with the government, to put somebody else in prison. So, <clears throat> every time my friend would go to court, Rick Turner, every time he, he met with the prosecutor, with his, him and his attorney met with the prosecutor to discuss, you know, a plea agreement or whatever, every single time the prosecutor will present Rick with three letters. Each letter is saying that Rick Turner was in a cell with Paul Manafort and through their course of conversation, Paul Manafort confined in him these certain things. These are three different letters with different stuff, stuff that they were trying to get Paul Manafort and Donald Trump on. So every time my friend went to court, the prosecutor would present, would present these letters for him and ask him to sign one of them. Now, I've taken you through the course of Rick's history. He's not a gangbanger. He wasn't a dope dealer. He didn't grow up in the streets. He came from a middle-class home. His family ended up, you know, doing good with their health care service, you know, helping the community and end up selling it to the state. And that's how part of their wealth or money came from. So he was in a person that because of his circumstances felt that he needed to go and rob a bank or sell drugs or any other type of crime to support himself or his lifestyle. <clears throat> the prosecutor knows that. You know, when, when they arrest you, they do what is called discovery. They send agents out there to go find anything and everything about you. They turn over every rock, look in every bush and find out and put up a, <clears throat> a report together about how they feel you as a person and stuff you were doing out here in the street. Do they feel you need to be put away forever or do they feel that, hey, you might be able to adjust to society, so on and so forth. So they know that this man is not a drug kingpin. They know that he was not a leader of some blood gang and his nickname was Mick Jagger. They know that. Because the time that he got arrested, he was so clueless to the world that he had, had involved himself in that he practically turned himself in. Like when they came in and raided the house, he was downstairs smoking. They arrested everybody upstairs, confiscated whatever. Him being downstairs, he didn't even know what the hell was going on. He was down there smoking. And while they're arresting people up there and doing whatever they're doing, he comes up the stairs and is like, hey, what's going on? And all the cops turn and like, oh, there's another person. There's another person. And they're arresting him. Like, if he knew anything or had any type of sense, he would have got his ass out the back door or down the street. But in his mind, he was just a smoker. You know, he's just out here on a, on a meth binge. But when he gets arrested, he refused to cooperate. And part of the reason that he refused, refused to cooperate, I don't know if, if it was his sense of integrity, that his natural, like, his common sense to know that you shouldn't tell on people, or the simple fact that he absolutely didn't know anything that was going on. And I'm going to lean over, I'm going to lean towards the latter. This dude was clueless, didn't know what was going on. Because you would think, a person like him facing 40 years would be quick to tell on somebody to get out of their sentence. But at the same time, he was a person of integrity. You know, through the course of our conversation, I liked him. I enjoyed his company. I enjoyed the conversation that we engaged in. He was intelligent. He had a lot of common sense, which a lot of people in prison are lacking. And my favorite part is that he never once pretended to be anybody that he wasn't. 
you know? And while he was there, he was privy to a lot of things that was going on. As far as being, seeing the violence that took place. One time, and I'm not gonna go into the story about how this happened, because I'm focusing on Rick and his mental state leading up to his suicide. So one time, the deuces go off. When the deuces go off, I'm in the unit. I go get my uh, MP3 player. They sell us MP3 players for $88 inside the penitentiary. My wife says, you can get that shit out here for like $15, $25 if they even make it anymore, right? But anyway, they sell us an MP3 player for $88 and uh, we're able to download, buy music for a dollar, dollar thirty, whatever. So I got my MP player on the computer being charged up because, you know, you got to charge it. It only lasts maybe, if, you know, 12 hours or something on the charge. So I charge my, I got my MP3 player charged. The deuces go off. So I know they're about to lock down. You know, the CO is calling for lockdown, lockdown. So I run over there to go grab my MP player. When I grab my MP player, I'm looking at the door and the door opens and the victim that's just been getting butchered out there in the Sally port stumbles in the hallway and falls down. But before he falls down, He's on his knees in his hand. And from where I was standing, looking to my right, I know the person, you know, I know this dude and I'll share you that story when we get there. But <clears throat> when I looked at him, you couldn't see his face from, from his head down, all his chest, his neck, his stomach, everything was all bloody. You know, two dudes caught him slipping in the sally port and butchered him. So, somehow, whatever, after they got done butchering him, they left, but he was, at the, he was at the sally port. He's not in our unit. He just came by to grab a care package from some of us, because the dude that, the victim that was getting butchered is from Utah. And, um, well, he came in, was on his knees, then he collapsed. There was blood puddle everywhere. Like I said, from his head, his face, down his shirt, it was just soaked with blood. You couldn't see the color of his khakis, you couldn't see his, his nose, you couldn't see his eyes. This dude was fucked off all the way I don't know, to Sunday, I don't know how that, how that, how that saying goes, but so at the time that this was happening, it was recall. So all the yard is coming back in. So I guess Rick didn't know what was going on because, you know, when he came in, he had to come into our unit and I'm sitting there watching him, watching the dude laying, you know, he's laid down, he's all bloody and people are coming in. And the people that are coming to the unit are just walking over the body, you know, or, or veering around it or walking around it so they don't step in a puddle. And one other person was Rick. You know, when he came in, he seen a body on the ground, all bloody, a pool of blood around it. And he, just like everybody else, stepped over the body and came into the unit. You know, at this time, he was writing his sister and he was telling her like, you know, every day I'm in fear of my life. You know, in the penitentiary, it's hard for white dudes, white dudes that aren't on gang time, white dudes that aren't into that white supremacist shit. It makes it hard for they have a little harder time because you have all these gang members, these white supremacist gang members, these neo-Nazi that are pressuring these dudes to join or to adopt their ideology. And Rick grew up working in a clinic 
You know, he, he followed his mom into the healthcare profession, uh, prof profession and he worked with, uh, in, a, in an insane asylum. You know, he worked out with patients and he was good with people. Like, when you have a conversation with, with this guy, it's hard not to like him. He's funny as hell, he's goofy, but like I said, my favorite part about him was his sincerity. Like he never once pretended to be anybody else that he wasn't, you know? And I appreciate that because that allows me to evaluate this person for who they are and I get to decide if I like it, accept it or not. As opposed to somebody pretending to be somebody that they're not and you like them according to the person that they pretend to be then find out the truth about them, then you're like, oh, this dude's a piece of shit, right? So, you know, at this time, we were locked down because there was a lot of shit that was going on in the compound. And during one of our lockdown, I guess his pros uh, his attorney been trying to reach him. But um, our, our counselor, we call her Miss G. I don't really know how to pronounce her name, but... She was worthless. She didn't do shit. Like most of the counselors in there, I've only met one or two counselors that did their job and was on top of it. And one of them was Mr. Adams, my counselor before I left Florence. But for the most part, these people don't give a shit about you. They had his attorney calling her, trying to get uh, their client on the phone. And she's like, oh, we're locked down, we're locked down. But she never even told him that the pros that his attorney was trying to reach him, you know? So by the time he come out, you know, she told him, hey, we were locked down, your attorney was trying to reach you. So he calls his attorney thinking that there's some break, some news in his appeal. And it turned out, now, I'm still having a hard time trying to understand this. When you get convicted at trial, found guilty and convicted, your only recourse to get back, to get some type of justice, is through the direct appeal process. The direct appeal process is you challenging things that happen through the course of your, of your case, from the beginning, from the time you got arrested, to the evidence that was brought up before you, and how the trial was conducted. So anywhere along the line that you've seen that the prosecutor or the state or whatever, then play by the rules and you can prove it, that they you know, made up shit or presented evidence that shouldn't have been in there or whatever, you can challenge it through your direct appeal. Your direct appeal is basically your only recourse to get back into court. Like once you lose your direct appeal, you have what they call a 2255. Then they have what they call a 2255 second in successive. Then after that, they have what is called a 2241 which you're not challenging your criminal conviction, but more like your civil rights and stuff. But when, by the time you get down to 2241, like I've been, it's pretty much hopeless because if you're not able to win your appeal on the direct appeal, then the 2255, the 2255 second in successive, and 2241, any other, and any other motions that you can come up with to file the courts really don't pay much attention to it unless it's just some ongoing issue that they have to decide one way or the other. But when he finally got on the phone with his attorney, he found out that his attorney had filed a motion to dismiss his appeal. Think about that. Your direct appeal is the only recourse to get some justice, and this attorney just filed a motion to dismiss it. So another month go by, he's trying to get a hold of his attorney and can't. And it turned out that he got a brand new attorney appointed to him because his previous attorney was just made into a judge. You know, his case was a high-profile high case 
due to the fact that his sister was up there in Capitol Hill every other week, every other month, trying to get senators and congressmen to look at his case to show them, like, this is a first-time offender and getting 40 years. Now, at the time he got sentenced, just a few months later, Donald Trump and the rest of Congress passed the First Step Act. The First Step Act says you can't compound people's sentence. Like if I got arrested with three guns, that is one arrest. So whatever the minimum mandatory is, which let's say 10 years, then that's what I should get for this particular indictment. But the way the prosecutor was sentencing people was I got caught with three guns. So they go and say, all right, we're going to give you five years for the first gun. We're going to give you 10 years for the second gun and give you 20 years for the third gun. You know, compounding it. So instead of getting a 10-year minimum mandatory that I should have gotten for this one case, the prosecutor broke down these guns in, into each of their own element and gave me time and compound time for each one. So instead of getting 10 years, my sentence ends up being 35 years. And those people that were sentenced like that after the First Step Act was getting action back, was getting their time knocked off. Like a lot of my friends that had life sentence were able to use the First Step Act and get home. But of course they have already been down 26 to 30 years. And there's still some in there that are not able to use the First Step Act yet that's been down 40 years and are trying to get home. So if he was sentenced, if Rick was sentenced after the, after the First Step Act, he would have only gotten maybe 10 to 15 years. But he didn't get sentenced after the First Step Act. He got sentenced before and ended up getting 40 years. And the First Step Act wasn't made retroactive. So when it came down, he couldn't even use it to help his case. But <clears throat> the reason that Rick got 40 years is because he refused to cooperate with the prosecutor. He refused to testify against the gang leader that testified against him that ended up only getting 16 years for being the guy that was running guns and running dope. Again, the reason that my friend got 40 years is because he refused to sign a statement on Paul Manafort. And the reason he refused to sign a statement on Paul Manafort was because the statement that the prosecutor wrote up were false. At no time during the year and some change that he spent being Paul Manafort's celly did Paul Manafort ever confining him about anything that he was doing with Donald Trump or anything else. So he was telling the prosecutor the truth. I don't know anything about this guy. This guy doesn't tell me anything. We don't engage in those conversations. So I can't with clear conscience sign a statement saying that this guy, Paul Manafort, shared inf information with me. So because he refused to sign a statement, a false statement on somebody that he doesn't know. And because he refused to testify against other people that was on his indictment, the prosecutor chose to pursue this line of conviction. Anybody and everybody knows they could have dropped their charges to simple possession or distribution or whatever that didn't carry the minimum mandatory or the 40 year sentence. But the prosecutor didn't want to do that because the prosecutor wanted to put pressure on him to help convict this political freaking <clears throat> kangaroo court that they got all these politicians going through at this time. And my friend Rick Turner ended up getting caught in the dragnet. The reason he took his case to trial because he felt that he shouldn't have got more than 10 years. He was okay that he was going to get serve a prison, a prison sentence because he knows what he's done. He knows it's against the law to be smoking dope and selling dope and all that, but not against the law to where it's 40 years. So he didn't think that he was going to get a 40 year sentence. 
and went to trial because he was challenging the things that the prosecutor were putting up against him to be false. They brought two people to testify against him. Two informants, two undercover cops, not undercover cops, but two informants. One that said they bought dope with, from him and another one that said they bought guns from him. Now, while we're fighting, while he's fighting the case, he finds out that one of the witness that they brought to testify against him that said that they purchased a controlled buy from Rick Turner, the date that was in question, Rick found out the date that this guy that testifies that had supposedly met him and bought drugs from Rick, there was no way the dude could do it because at the time, the date that said that this shit happened, the dude was incarcerated. Think about that. The dude was incarcerated. So if you're in locked up, what happened? Did the sheriff or somebody let this fucker out the back door to go buy some dope for the prosecutor and then put him back in jail? Then also, they discover that the prosecutor has been helping this dude out. Maybe not the prosecutor himself, but whoever his control agent was, was helping this dude out with his mom's rent. Giving his mom money, helping her out with her, her rent in exchange for his cooperation. Now, same thing with the second guy that said that they bought guns and stuff from Rick. For what, I don't know exactly the details of that, so I don't want to just put shit in my mouth that I can't stand on. But whatever it is, they found that, that the time that they supposedly had purchased guns or dope from Rick didn't coincide with what had, they had going on with their lives, whether it be incarcerated or out of town or whatever. My point being is that the prosecutor knew this, yet they still brought these guys up as a witness, as an incredible witness to lie on Rick and get him a conviction. So when Rick brought up this issue to them, Like again, his attorney filed a motion to dismiss his appeal. And I'm not sure really what happened with the story after that because at this time they were making our block DA into a honor unit. So everybody in that unit that hasn't gotten in trouble or they feel qualified for the honor status gets to stay in the block and gets a single cell. Of course, I didn't qualify to be in the honor block. So everybody that didn't qualify to be in the honor block, they had us pack up and relocate us to different unit. I got sent to EA, but I ask you to be patient with me. I'm trying to take you through the course of this, through my friend Rick Turner's journey to give you a first-hand glimpse of what he was going through, not only being in the block with me, but the stuff that's going on in the courts. Welcome to the USP.